Okay, the war in Ukraine officially started in uh, 2014, uh, right after the CIA engineered a coup d'etat in Kiev, which illegally removed the democratically elected president Viktor Yanukovych. However, since the direct Russian involvement in uh, the Ukrainian scene by sending Russian forces into Ukraine, we hear on a regular basis that the Russian offensive was unprovoked and the Russian bombing of Ukrainian cities are unprecedented. So unprovoked and unprecedented to the extent that Russia must be removed from the UN Security Council membership and to be considered a terrorist state. While it is not my job and duty or the intention to defend Russia's offensive, which is without a doubt tragic and innocent uh, Ukrainians are dying on a daily basis, I would like to discuss the two arguments often uh, repeated by Western officials, unprovoked and unprecedented. If we start from the unprovoked, uh, firstly, we have to agree that NATO is not a defensive alliance. It is uh, an off offensive organization whose main objective after the fall of the Soviet Union is to protect the hegemonic status of the American empire. And I call it an American empire, or when I call it an American empire, I remember one of the quotes or the statements of the American uh, philosopher Noam Chomsky, who said, um, most Americans do not know that the United States is an empire and they don't know that they don't know. I think it's an interesting quote uh, about, about this because so many people do not see the United States as an empire. Anyways, so the, the NATO duty is to preserve the hegemonic status of the American empire by establishing a military alliance uh, among uh, like-minded uh, countries to prevent the rise of any challenging power, whether economically or militarily, that may pose a threat to the unipolar world order. And the countries that pose any threat uh, to the US absolute hegemony on the global level or in any continent are uh, brutally smashed, destroyed, uh, such as the case of Yugoslavia, Libya, and non directly in Syria. Now, the countries whose people aren't uh, very friendly to NATO or they have uh, their biases in favor of Russia and they don't voluntarily join NATO or uh, embed themselves with NATO indirectly, for example, like the case of Ukraine. Um, but these countries are have enormous geopolitical importance. So these countries are witnessing the so-called color revolutions, which are basically a long-term indoctrination process and social engineering of certain people through education, through the so-called non-governmental organizations, the media, movies, music, art, etc., to attract the younger generation and change their values and hence perception of global politics. This has happened, for example, in Georgia, it happened in Ukraine, it happened in Armenia and other places in Eastern Europe or the former Soviet Union countries. For, but for the sake of uh, today's uh, video, I will focus on Ukraine. So the first question here is, has the United States meddled in Ukraine? And for what reasons? First things first, the former, and, and currently she's also official, but the former Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, uh, she was the engineer of the coup d'etat in, in Ukraine. In 2014, uh, she confessed uh, in February 2014 that Washington has spent $5 billion to, quote, subvert Ukraine. I would like to play this uh, clip to you. So this is it. This is the video. Uh, it's not a high quality video. Somebody from the audience recorded it, but I think it's clear enough to understand what she says. 
restraint. Since Ukraine's independence in 1991, the United States has supported Ukrainians as they build democratic skills and institutions, as they promote civic participation and good governance, all of which are preconditions for Ukraine to achieve its European aspirations. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. Today, there are senior officials in the Ukrainian government, in the business community, as well as in the opposition, civil society, and the religious community who believe in this democratic and European future for their country. And they've been working hard to move their country and their president in the right direction. We urge the government, we urge the president to listen to these voices, to listen to the Ukrainian people, to listen to the Euromaidan and take Ukraine forward. The support of the people in this room is absolutely essential. We thank you for all you are doing. We thank you for your partnership all these years, and we look forward to continuing to stand shoulder to shoulder with you as we take Ukraine into the future that it deserves. Thank you very much for the time today. So basically, um, I think she was addressing here to Viktor Yanukovych before his removal from power. And I don't think the United States would have removed him from power unless he stopped the American project there. And I think Yanukovych was not pro-Russian and was not pro-American. He was trying to find a balance because Ukraine is divided uh, country, uh, just like many other countries, especially politically and ethnically. And he said, OK, if we want to join, if we want to join EU or NATO, I want to put this uh, into a referendum. Let's see what the people want. And the Americans didn't like that. So they removed him from power because they wanted Ukraine uh, to join uh, NATO in further, let's say, expansion of NATO towards the east. But this doesn't stop here because uh, some people would say, okay, the United States supported the just, you know, the rebels or the democratic people there because, you know, we want to establish a democracy in Ukraine. But this is a, a phone call was tapped, her phone call actually, in Victoria Nuland. So it says uh, the phone call was backed uh, and the conversation was with the senior US diplomat uh, disparages the EU over the Ukraine crisis has been posted online. The alleged conversation between Assistant Secretary of State, uh, of State Victoria Nuland and the US Ambassador to Ukraine, Geoffrey Piat. So the US, uh, this is Jonathan Marcus, and he makes a comment on this. The US says that it is working with all sides in the crisis to reach a peaceful solution noting that ultimately it is up to the Ukrainian people to decide their future. However, this transcript or the transcript of this audio conversation that we will listen to it together suggests that the U.S. has very clear ideas about what the outcome should be and is striving to achieve these goals. So the United States had a clear uh, idea how Ukraine should be after the removal of Viktor Yanukovych. And Victoria Nuland, she was discussing this issue with the uh, ambassador of the United States in Kiev um, regarding this issue. Um, I apologize if this video, <laughs> if this picture, I don't know. I think this is, again, the um, American ambassador. I'm not sure. Anyways, so this is the conversation. Let's listen to it together. Here's the next step. My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, three plus one conversation or three plus two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed. But I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, Klitschko has been the top dog, he's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got. He's probably talking to his guys at this point. So, I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written – oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. 
So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it. And, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does, if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. And again, the fact that this is out there right now, I'm still trying to figure out in my mind why Yanukovych that. But in the meantime, there's a party of regions faction meeting going on right now, and I'm sure there's a lively argument going on in that group at this point. But uh, anyway, we could uh, we could land jelly side up on this one if we move fast. So let me work on let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other, the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we can probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR saying you need Biden. And I said, probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. So, um, what we hear in the media that the United States respects the will of the people and they don't intervene in the uh, internal affairs aren't really true. And behind the scenes, uh, you can see how um, the United States State Department official is trying to influence the domestic politics in uh, a country like Ukraine, which is one of the most important regions for Russia in an apparent provocation, I would say, to uh, the Russian bear poking the Russian bear for at least eight years now in the Ukrainian scene, and uh, before that happened in uh, in Syria. But this, um, I would say, intervention or meddling in domestic affairs aren't exclusive for the governments, but also you have in parallel so-called non-governmental organizations funded by, uh, indirectly, I would say, by the CIA. And those... Uh, organizations include the USAID, the NED, and organizations affiliated to George Soros. For example, George Soros, he was very clear about his role in, in Ukraine, and he mentioned it a few times. And I think whenever the uh, George Soros intervenes somewhere, I don't think there is any good for the people of this uh, region. So this is George Soros and Ukraine, the title says, Connect the Dots. I will play this so we can watch it together. In 1990, which was two years before the independence of Ukraine. Where does George Soros figure all this? Unfortunately, everywhere. If we talked about some positive results from the activities of this gentleman, then we should have noted some success. But his activity is mainly focused on those countries where he took an active position with his various funds. We remember the countries in North Africa where the Arab Spring happened. Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt. We remember the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan. We remember the Rose Revolution in Georgia. We remember the Orange Revolution in 2004. And finally, the consequences of not only the Orange Revolution, but also the Revolution of Dignity of 2013 and 2014. This is also his activity. He did not stop. He continued to operate in 2015 and 2016. Hillary Clinton comes in as Secretary of State, and at that point, she sets up a private email system. I think now it's pretty clear that part of what was going on is they were setting up the underpinnings that would set up the Madan. She introduced a program called Civil Society 2.0. What we've done with Secretary Clinton's Civil Society 2.0 program is we've taken one of America's undeniable strengths, the strength of our technology and of our innovators, and we put them to work in service of our diplomatic goals. This is a way for the U.S. government to work directly with NGOs like International Renaissance, funded by George Soros. And while working with those NGOs, fund money to them, but also training. And the kind of training that would be used when the Madan would start. So this was a part, uh, a, a short part of, uh, I think, the documentary of Oliver Stone. 
Ukraine on Fire, uh, when they speak about the role of George Soros, I highly recommend you to watch this documentary, guys. I will, again, put the link in the description below from Rumble because YouTube deleted uh, this documentary uh, <laughs> from their platform. Yeah, uh, I'm not surprised at all. But also, I have made a video about George Soros' uh, role um, in Ukraine. I will just play a short part of it for you. You can watch the full video under the short servers. Russia and China are the biggest threats to open society if you want to watch the longer version. One of the countries that Soros sent millions to is Ukraine, where Soros' open society has contributed around a quarter billion dollars in grants to Ukraine to support democratic practices, human rights, and independent journalism. We have a foundation in Ukraine, and it happens to be one of our best foundations leading civil society. I also want to mention that uh, there is one pers person who was very deeply involved in Ukraine, uh, and, and that's Biden. He had a lot more patience than I had in, in uh, trying to convert Poroshenko into a democratic leader. So this is just a short part. Uh, like he, he established his NGOs in Ukraine for a very long time after the um, fall of the Soviet Union. And what, what is the goal, right? You have to ask this question. The main goal is to convert the people of the regions uh, in the sphere of influence of uh, Russia using uh, American soft power. And this process it means the people will gradually hold friendly opinions on the United States and the EU and hostile towards uh, or hostile opinions towards Russia. And then when enough people are converted, the civil society um, will be trained uh, by these NGOs to organize an opposition to the current uh, ruling elite or the government uh, to be outspoken and convincing through uh, traditional and social media outlets and finally trigger a civil unrest and call it a revolution. This strategy is very efficient um, in regions the United States cannot or doesn't want to uh, directly intervene or use military means. Now, if we, this is to, to when, when I address the unprovoked part, right, uh, towards Russia, and it's pretty obvious that all these conversion that happened in this area for the people to become more hostile towards Russia and now in countries like Poland, in Ukraine, etc., in Georgia, and also nowadays in Armenia. And this has taken uh, a process. It, 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 it took them to like a few decades to convert the people and it's a long-term strategy and they succeeded it partially succeeded it in few parts un unless the people are ethnically russian for example in eastern ukraine and they have their own affiliations to russia so i also made a video by the way about the soft power of uh, russia and i criticized uh, that that russia never presented uh, a, a model an ideological model a cultural model for the younger generations. I'm talking about after the fall of the Soviet Union. So there is nothing attractive culturally, ideologically um, towards Russia, uh, in exception for lots of people's hatred towards whether the United States or the neoliberal value system in uh, Western societies that they dislike, so they uh, would prefer uh, the Russian model. Now, the second point is that the bombing campaign was unprecedented. First things first, I condemn the killing of uh, uh, civilians or hitting uh, civilian uh, infrastructure and civilian targets. And what happened in Kiev and Lviv, for example, in the past two days uh, is very tragic. We shouldn't lose our humanity and cherish civilian deaths because our attitude is based on replacing the current international system, which resorts to inhumane policies such as indiscriminate bombing, murdering civilians, occupying countries, looting their na natural resources and imposing draconian sanctions. Uh, and we, so we want to replace this with a fairer and more human system. Um, while the bombing of uh, Kiev was tragic, I would like to, of course, uh, show you what the United States uh, or NATO and, in, of course, in uh, and all the allies, right, of NATO did 
uh, to Iraq in 2003, uh, and uh, also what they did in um, uh, Serbia in 1999 uh, but for iraq uh, firstly they have turned iraq from the cradle to the grave of civilizations and i posted this video today on twitter when the bombing campaign started in iraq let's watch it together <laughs> Beneath all of this, emergency teams raced across the city. I personally remember this day very well and it was very uh, sad and um, I remember that uh, I cried a lot when Iraq has uh, fallen although uh, I mean I dislike Saddam Hussein and we know it's not about Saddam Hussein and we know um, the real reasons behind this invasion and also how can it affect uh, or impact the Syrian uh, Syrians right because we are a uh, lot there is lots of similarities on the social level between the Iraqis and the Syrians. And what we have seen in 2011, it, I think, is a continuation for the 2003 war in Iraq. Um, if you want, maybe I would also just quickly show you what the NATO did in uh, Serbia in 1999, like a similar bombing campaign. <laughs> Queste sono le immagini dei bombardamenti della Nato su Belgrado. Sono le ore 19.30 del 24 marzo del 1999, nove anni fa. Per vincere la guerra gli aerei della Nato distruggono. 82 ponti. le raffinerie di petrolio e 14 centrali termoelettriche, 13 aeroporti e 20 stazioni ferroviarie e 121 fabbriche. Per vincere la guerra gli aerei della Nato infliggono alla serie... So, as you can see, this is the aftermath of the uh, bombing of uh, Belgrad, um, also in uh, Iraq and tens of thousands of people perished uh, <clears throat> during this uh, bombing campaign of uh, the United States and its allies on these countries. 
so I wanted to address these two issues uh, that we repeatedly hear in the media by certain officials that the Russian <coughs> attack, invasion, offensive, call it whatever you want, of Ukraine is unprovoked and unprecedented. Um, it happened in the middle of Europe just two decades ago, so it's not unprecedented. And was it unprovoked? I explained to you, but what do you think? Do you think it was unprovoked or it was provoked? And please let me know why. And do you think the Russian response is justified? And how can you justify the bombing of Kiev, Lviv and other uh, cities? What What is the pretext? What is the goal? except for revenge and um, like retaliation for the bombing of the Crimea bridge. Let me know your opinion in the comments below. I've been your host, Gerok Almasian of Serviana Analysis. If you're new, please subscribe and hit the like button. It's a great help to me. And also, I would like to deliver my uh, thanks and gratitude to all the supporters of Serviana Analysis, those who are supporting me financially, whether by becoming a patron or simply by joining the membership of uh, my YouTube channel uh, or through PayPal. You can see all the links in the description below. This help is very, very essential for me to continue and bring you more content like this. And see you next time.